Yeah, you didn't have the whole mindset of all it is right here. It's a whole other world that right here. And I didn't have it before, but it's okay. Won't you give it up for the band? Yeah. Okay, now, I want you to understand something. We don't need a whole lot of people to talk there. That's a good thing. We don't need a whole lot of people here. But we don't care. So I don't need to hear a smattering of hands. I need to hear thunderous applause every time I ask you to clap your hands. Charles Mitchell, and I think I heard Sasha up here earlier tonight, didn't I? Yeah. Both of them, for welcoming me, for inviting me to be a part of the 104.1 experience and their Valentine's uh, weekend extravaganza. And uh, can you turn me down just a little bit? I'm a little, little shot, a little hot up here in my monitor, in my monitor, in my monitor, in my monitor. Welcome everybody and happy Valentine's weekend. Get my monitor, get my monitor. Down, down. Me, me. Yeah, it's really loud. And ready. One, two, one, two. I hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. A lot of love. A lot of love. Yeah. Well, what we're going to do here tonight is pay tribute to the legacy of Mrs. Phyllis Hyman. We have Phyllis Hyman fans in the house, yeah? Ladies, you can sit for a second. Uh, this show came together out of what they call supply and demand. In the late 90s, I was a part of a cast of a show called Thank God the Beat Goes On, which featured the Whispers. And it was a story of the Whispers' journey from their meager beginnings to their meteoric icon status. And of course, Phyllis Hyman was a part of that show because back in the day, they did it. That was a good ticket. Not only for an audience, but for a promoter. That was a money maker. Phyllis Hyman and the Whispers happened a lot. As a consequence of that, yeah. Consequently, they had became good friends personally, and they had obviously a wonderful working relationship. Um, and so they wanted to show that and depict that. The other part of it is that, uh, true to life, Phyllis's last performance that she was scheduled to perform was with the listeners at the Apollo. And that is where the show was set. And uh, as it is not my intention to imitate her, emulate her, but to evoke her spirit, I put together old friends. As people began to ask me, began to ask me, when are you going to do the Phyllis Hammond show again? When are you going to do it? Well, honey, it wasn't a Phyllis Hammond show. It was the Whisper show. Just so happened, Phyllis was a part of it, and because we lost her so suddenly and so tragically, people, you know how we like to gravitate to the cup. But I decided that I didn't want to dwell on her death, but to celebrate her life and her music. Old friends. Now this is what you won't get anywhere else. Because we were personal friends, she was a, a, a mentor to me. She was someone I looked up to. When I was coming up, before I became that first lady of Def Jam, y'all know I'm the first lady of Def Jam. Oh, yeah. Before all that happened, I met Phyllis Hyman, and she became a friend and a mentor and then like a big sister. And it was just the most incredible thing to look at someone whose music you hear on the radio, whose music you, you play on your cassette player. Yeah, cassettes. And they become your brand. It was, it, it's magical. And, uh, well, I can tell you things that other people cannot tell you. I will start with this. Quick pull this line and so It was three weeks before her birthday. And we were all in D.C. playing together. Um, myself, working for one of the uh, major promoters in the Washington, D.C. area. Phyllis Hyman at uh, Hotel Washington, and uh, Nancy Wilson at Blues Alley. Yeah. It was Father's Day weekend, and we all decided we were going to get together and meet at B. Smith's at Union Station in D.C. for Father's Day brunch. And the whole week, Phyllis had been a little in a way, and the promoters that had brought her in were feeling that they were concerned, and we all were. So we thought that this little outing would be really great. So we all met over at B. Smith's and Union Station, and we sat there for a while, and we 
looked at the menu, and Phyllis read the paper. She looked at the menu and she felt, I don't like this prefix menu. I want to go somewhere else, somewhere in Georgetown. I'm going. So she left. We put in a can. She left. That was a Sunday. We had shows that evening and everybody went home on Monday. The following Wednesday, I showed up in New York City. I was living out of state at the time. Y'all know I'm from home, right? But I was living out of state at the time and I had come into New York and when I came home to New York, I would go home. And one of the places I'd go home is the Apollo Theater because I could find all my friends and find all the crew and find all the band and great shoes and stuff. And we would talk and I would find out what was going on. Thursday came, Friday came. I talked to one of them, the Phyllis Hines and bandmates, and we were about to come collaborate on some music, and he said, I can't talk to you right now, I'm on my way to rehearsal. You know I don't want to be late, because Phyllis will cuss me out. You know Phyllis will cuss. <laughs> we'll get back to that in a minute. The next day, I went to the airport, and I took off for the first annual Essence Festival. Very first one. And I got on the plane, and I landed in Cincinnati, or wherever it was my connection was, and someone called me on the phone and said, Allison, Allison, are you still in town? I said, no, I'm on my way to New Orleans, girl, town, going to the uh, Essence Festival. Oh, I said, what's up? Well, um, we got a show here tonight at the Apollo, and uh, um, I don't, they don't think Phyllis gonna make it, so we want to know if you can uh, fill in. I said, no, I'm already gone. And, I'm, and, they, and I can hear in the background, hindsight now, lots of energy, lots of talking, lots of things, and even now thinking and knowing the words, hang up, don't say nothing, just hang up, just, just, just kind of shut I got on the next plane, and when I landed in New Orleans, a couple hours later, another good friend of mine called me, Chandra Armstrong, and said, girl, Phyllis is gone. I said, what do you mean? She said, girl, she's gone. She committed suicide. I said, I didn't know I've been flying, and I, and I, and I, and I hung up the phone. And I don't really remember a lot for like about a good half hour, but I do remember being in baggage claim against the wall, and if you can imagine the world of people that were coming to and fro, and I looked up and these two women looked at me and they said, sister, we don't really know what's going on with you right now, but we'd like to help you get to wherever it is you need to go. And they lifted me up off the ground, and they got me to the rental car, shuttle. And I got to this place, and I got the rental car, and I went to the hotel and tried to figure out what was going to happen. I remember that entire weekend being followed by press because they either knew our relationship or because I had always been compared to Phyllis, felt that I would be the person they could ask what was going on, what had happened. I didn't have any real answers, but I did the best I could. Long story short, Phyllis was gone, and it was a year to the date of that week that I got a call from the Whispers asking me to come and play Phyllis Hyman in Thank God the Day Goes On. And I believe it was Phyllis waving her celestial magic wand that put me in that place. That's why I put together old friends while we're here tonight. You know, Phyllis, Phyllis sang with a heart that was full of passion and love and emotion. She sang with a voice that was well, it's rarely heard in singers of today. She was a multi-talented performer and a multifaceted human being whose voice was quieted far too soon. Let's go back. The year is 1979, and Miss Phyllis Hyman is about to take center stage. How about that? Put it together for Miss Phyllis Hyman.
nothing 